glass of mine. We'll move then on. We'll move then on to the last round of paper speakers. So closing the case tonight in favour of abolishing the House of Lords um, is Christopher Lord. Christopher is a first year reading human social political sciences at Christ College. He won the right um, to speak through open audition. Christopher, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Now, I want to start off this debate by saying, despite my name, I am in fact not a lord. You see, when I lived in the United States, I would tell my friends there is no relation to the singer from New Zealand, and now in the Cambridge Union, I have to tell standing committee I don't actually have powerful connections to bring here. But aside from that, there's a more sinister reason for why I'm named Christopher Lord. You see, during the era of British colonialism, the era particularly of slavery, members of the House of Lords who owned plantations gave to their slaves the surname Lord. I descend from a plantation in Barbados, as does Audrey Lord and a million other people with the surname Lord all across the Caribbean. The House of Lords, in and of itself, in the history that has been so greatly, you know, pervaded as some vibes-based rule or whatever, is honestly quite deeply institutionally broken. Lord Norton, the noble Lord Norton, has spoken in ideal types of what the House of Lords should be. This idea that it creates well-devised and clear principled law with clear principles. But, as Stafford Beer once said, there is no point in claiming that the purpose of a system is to do what it consistently fails to do. We've seen in the case of Rwanda, we've seen in the case of the illegal migration bill, we've seen in the case of the protest bill, time and time again, the House of Lords has failed, fundamentally failed, to combat the extremism, the populism, the horrors that come out of the House of Commons. I'm not going to stand up here and say that the House of Commons doesn't need reform. I'm not going to stand up here and say there doesn't need to be widespread political change. But that should include, and as Kezia Dugdale mentioned, should start with the House of Lords. Now, go ahead. Well, I just said there's an issue with the Commons. Uh, Yeah, I'll let you clap. Or not. Okay. I've said that the issue is with, or it lies in the Commons, but it's also with the House of Lords. You know, we've been um, told today that the point of the House of Lords is to make sure that law is well principled, to make sure that law is well devised, to make sure that the law makes sense. When the law contradicts itself, when the law contradicts international law, when the law contradicts our basic morals, that means that the House of Lords is fundamentally failing. Now, let me talk about the composition of the House of Lords, because it's something that's been brought up a few times uh, today, but not in detail. So, first of all, I want to mention, you know, there are a lot of lords who have worked amazingly hard to get to the position in which they hold today, who come from backgrounds who, you know, you wouldn't envision as being some sort of hereditary peer, who come from backgrounds like mine, right? But the fact of the matter is, almost 70% of lords, out of the the 632 whose... um, education, like secondary school education is known, went to a private school. That is completely, completely removed from the reality for most British citizens today. 70% received private education. Well, Noble Lord Morton, I want to note that, you know, I'm not saying that there doesn't need to, or there don't need to be changes in the general, you know, political system we're putting today. I'm not saying that the House of Commons is deep, isn't deeply unrepresentative. I'm not saying that these, exist, uh, these issues aren't widespread. But nonetheless, they exist in the House of Lords, and thus the House of Lords needs to be fundamentally changed. In fact, there are more men named John than, people from, uh, than lords from Bristol, uh, Liverpool, and Glasgow combined. Men named John, no offense to the lovely John de Bursa sitting over there at the edge of the room. I mean, again, I'm making these points about the House of Lords, not to say that the issue doesn't lie in the House of Commons, not to say that there isn't a fundamental issue with the British political system in and of itself, but to say that these are most clearly and obviously represented in the House of Lords. And that has dangerous, extremely dangerous effects for when the House of Commons, which again, exactly... And I, and I like to back off that. I, I don't want to take too many points of information because I do have a speech myself to make and I'm five minutes in. Um, but I would like to say, to, to get to the point that I actually wanted to get to, is that, you know, these issues make for a deeply, 
deeply dangerous system in which the populism and extremism that comes, again, from the House of Commons has no actual pushback. We tell ourselves, oh, well, you know, the House of Lords will do something. The House of Lords can push back against it. The House of Lords can take action. But, you know, if we, if we look at the Salisbury Convention, which is the refusal to say no if it's on a party political platform, there is basically no safeguards against what is a rising tide of extremism and populism within the House of Lords today. The House of Lords tell themselves, oh, well, we'll reform ourselves, we'll fix things. You know, it's like Taylor Swift saying she can fix Matty Healy. It's not going to happen. The fact of the matter is, the House of Lords needs the ability to say no to the extremism that comes out of the Commons. Whether that's against people of colour, whether that's against the right to protest, whether that's against transgender healthcare, whether that's against women, whatever it is coming out of the House of Commons needs to have a sense of accountability. There, needs to be, there need to be checks on what the House of Commons is doing, and the House of Lords is fundamentally unable to provide those checks. The entire system needs reform entirely. It's not just the House of Lords. But the fact of the matter is, for those people who are most removed from the political systems in which we live today, the House of Lords means nothing to them. The fact of the matter is, in 2020, 15 out of the previous 16 Tory treasurers were then appointed to the House of Lords. It is no longer the ideal type that Lord Norsh mentioned, but instead is a tool for the most corrupt, for the most, you know, people who have the most money to give to their political party, the people who, uh, who can cash in the most favours, rather than the ideal ide or idea of, you know, some accountability system. Instead, it ultimately is able to do nothing except for entrench the current inequalities and take them to their most extreme point. When Britain is facing some of the most extreme poverty in the developed world, we need more people who are in direct contact with those they represent. We need more people who are answerable to the pleas that British citizens are making today. We need more people who are willing to take radical change and fight back against politicians who want to make the lives of ordinary British people worse. Well, I'd like to say, right, the fact of the matter is, is that we have people who are attempting to be on the ground helping people in need, but we need institutional support to make sure that things happen. The United Nations Special uh, Rapporteur, or whatever the word is, I've forgotten right now, said that poverty in the UK is a political choice. The fact of the matter is, we are being failed by our highest institutions of government. That's the House of Commons, and that's the House of Lords. One of the key reasons in which the House of Lords fails is because it is unable to fight back against some of the worst things that the House of Commons is doing. The British people, but as I've said today, the British people do not elect the House, or as has been said today, the British people do not elect the, House of Com elect the House of Commons in a way that typically makes any sense. That's why we need proportional representation, as was mentioned earlier. The House of... Oh. Voice crack. The House of Commons is deeply unrepresentative as well, but that isn't to say that the House of Lords is somehow better. We need to make sure that the people who are serving us as the British people are ones who represent our interests. We need to make sure that things actually get done. We need democratic and institutional safeguards against some of the most dangerous legislation to come out of the British Parliament in maybe even years. This refusal to say no to things just because they're on a party platform isn't something that's going to be sustainable. It isn't something that's going to last, and it's not something that makes for good governance, especially because of inequality. The House of Lords is unable to answer the call when the British people cry out for help. Because of the composition, the House of Lords isn't able to safeguard against attacks on our democracy, attacks on the right to protest, attacks on the right to use our free speech. Because of the composition and inequality consistent in the House of Lords, no, because I have a minute left, this is protected time, the House of Lords has failed at what it is supposed to do. I know I am over 10 minutes, but let me just say this one thing, because, you know, I've been interrupted a lot today. The fact of the matter is, the House of Lords has failed at what it intends to do. There is no point in claiming that the purpose of a system is what it consistently fails to do. It fails to ensure well-devised law. It fails to ensure clear principled law, especially when the British government has time after time after time shoved through laws that clearly violate international laws, treaty, and most importantly, morals. Thank you.